the red flag flying here. You know, you just stick around and have a, a little bit of a talk at this point. Hiya, Sarah. Who are you? Would you like to introduce yourself to us all? I think you know that. I'm Sarah. I'm from Hull. I'm a friend of Paul and Laura's. Um, and uh, now Samantha as well. Uh, yeah, we are. Um, I'm a Labour Party member. Um, my partner is secretary for Hull North Labour. Um, so I've become uh, active... Uh, within the Labour Party purely through association um, <laughs> my hard working other half. Um, I'm a teacher, secondary school maths teacher. Yay! Oh! Um, and I'm a working mum. No had... time for those primary school children either. They only become fit to talk to us 11, don't they? <laughs> oh, so that's gosh. Be great. <laughs> um, yeah. I really have enjoyed uh, tonight. Um, of course, the uh, Samantha's feminist rage really. A little bit of feminist rage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm interested to uh, the comment I posted um, at, the po at the point that you were talking about it. Um, was this Samantha? Are we going through statistics about working mothers and you know this marginalised faction of mums who um, either through choice or through need more often through need and um, go out to work paying the bills they might be single mums they might not be i'm not a single mum but I, I need to work we need both incomes to support our family we've got three kids um and um i was bemused by the idea um during lockdown early early part of lockdown when boris's um baby was born and the mainstream media decided to make a big deal of the fact that he was taking his paternity leave really seriously he even been changing nappies which I thought, oh, I mean, it's he's a modern man. Special time for, for you know, any any, you know, parents is is the birth of a newborn. But um, to for the mainstream media to make a big deal about the fact that Boris had really, you know, it, it got all hands on deck, you know, with caring for his his baby. Um, I, th I thought it just made a mockery of of the jobs that, particularly working mums. That you know, it's it's dads too, um, and there are an awful lot of single dads who. Um, are in the same position, feeling marginalised by by what's happened through this COVID crisis, um, either by you know being forced to rely on childcare provided by grandparents who really should be shielding, um, you know, forcing them to break the system, um, you know, because they have no choice, or to. Um, in the case of many people work reduced hours, I like usually was it 72% of, of working mums having to, on, on this survey, Samantha, having to work reduced hours because childcare plays such an important role um, in supporting the opportunity for these women to go out and work um, to earn the crust that they need. I, I'm just interested to know what you thought about that when, you know, it was, it was plastered all over the media about what a great dad Boris was, was being when there's you know, there's parents up and down the country doing this day in, day out without the opportunity to just take two weeks off during lockdown because they needed to put bread on the table. I'd, I'd be interested to hear your opinions on that. I mean, one of the things that appears to me straight away, Sarah, is, is that um, for, we, we, we talk about this um, in sometimes in a very middle class way and um, working class mothers have always had to go out to work and... Um, yeah. Uh, my, my wife's mother had to um, bring up uh, her child while her husband was working and she was working full time in the mill. And it, it's, it's, um, it's been, this isn't a new struggle, um, but it's one which I think is um, uh, continually misrepresented in the media and trivialised in the media by stories such as, as we were sold about that sort of, but I mean, I just find the whole thing of Boris being a good father um, offensive. The whole thing, given his history. And, and yet we just sold this and people lap it up. Now, what a, what a wonderful a chummy chap he is. Kelly, what would your answer be to Sarah's question? Well, uh, very, very similar to what you just said there, John. I remember when the child was born, um, thinking, you know, are, are, are we, oh, Boris, oh, look at him, he's such an amazing person. Taking, oh, he's taken all of his paternity as if that was a really special thing. When, you know, there are thousands and thousands of people who take paternity 
probably because I have to, or, or you know, because they, they may do for other reasons. Uh, that was my first thought, given his history. His history of publicly um, disrespecting the children he already has. And that's it, what he does. I mean, children deserve respect as much as every single other member of society. And that's what he's done, let's be honest. He disrespected the children he had before that one was born. And, you know, in years to come, the other kid, and I don't know how, how many he was, there was speculation that he didn't even know how many he had or something at one point. Um, you know, those, those kids are going to have to read those stories. Those kids are going to have to, oh, look, see, daddy was really, really nice to this one, took the paternity and changed for that reason, yet kind of dismissed us because he has kind of publicly dismissed them in ways. Um, and it, yeah, it was, it's just, and then it became a non-story very quickly and I kind of forgot he even had a baby. I think I that, um, I mean, what I do have to say is um, that, I mean, we, we laugh at the triviality of changing nappies, but it has really been a, a fact during this lockdown that all the studies have shown, Sarah, that uh, men have not pulled their weight within the family and, 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 and sort of, uh, and ex the, the, all the extra, well, most of the extra burden of the pandemic has fallen upon uh, the women of the family. And, and sort of they, where they've been key workers, they've been coming home and having to do the washing up and all, 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 all the, the, the cleaning. And, and, and sort of, and, and it's even, I was watching stage today with my wife and they were making a joke of it there. It was a sort of a, a funny point that he was pretending to homeschool the children um, and, and sort of unable to make a meal and it all ended up being his wife doing it. I mean, Paul, do you, do you, do you, think, do you think this is just a malaise of society or do you think it's a failure of government here? And, uh, I, I kind of want to talk about class a little bit here. Um, my, uh, and you mentioned like, you know, class a little bit, John. I wanted to know from, from mainly the women on the panel, but everyone else on the panel, um, what we think, sorry, do, do we think that this is a class issue? Because my friends are um, really good dads, generally. Like, all, my, I've got a really nice group of friends who are really committed dads and wouldn't think it would be unusual to change a nappy. And I think there's a lot of working class people who are like that, who are, are very hands-on. And, you know, there are different pressures on women. And, and this was a financial pressure we are talking about during the show. But, you know, is this, a, is this a class thing where working class men are more hands-on with their kids and then there's these upper class men who are making all these decisions about women? And I think a lot of working class men wouldn't necessarily describe themselves as feminists, but would behave in a much more egalitarian way within the home in a lot of cases. Um, that, that has been my experience, that there are a lot of good working class men out there who who do their share in the home. Kelly? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, both a class thing and a generational thing. Because I know like, I'll pick on my dad again because I like to pick on him. Um, he, I, 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 you know, I don't think he changed any going nappies and stuff like that. <laughs> I come from a, from a fairly low working class family. So I don't think, I think it is a class thing more now, more so now, in that you're right, the upper class men are oh, not changing no nappies, where's nanny type of attitude. But I think if you go back 40, 50 years, it was a generational thing. It was across the board, regardless of what class you were in. And I don't know who's to say some of those attitudes haven't been passed down through the generations. You know, who's to say that? I know, like my husband, he's always been quite hands on with the kids, but I know some of his friends never were. You know, you've got a good bunch of friends, Brown, or a good bunch of working class blokes who were not. I mean, I genuinely, I genuinely agree. I don't think it's to do with class. I don't think you can say that you know, working class men are hands on and middle class and upper class men aren't. And I don't think that works like that way at all. Oh Sam God. and Stuart, I'm going to come to you in two moments, but I'm just going to ask Sarah. I mean, have you any points to make at this point in the discussion, Sarah? Um, no, I mean, I would, I would, I would. Echo really what Kelly said there. I do. Th I do think a generational um, aspect plays into this. Um, I'm. I'm one of four. Um, I'm 
you know, 99% sure that um, the, the vast, vast majority of childcare responsibilities fell on my mum, not my dad. He was, um, you know, out at work all the time. He was the breadwinner um, in, the, in my, my youngest years. Um, but by the time I was at school, my mum was working full time as well. Both of them earning a crust, but it still fell on my mum. We spent an awful lot of time um, with grandparents, actually, um, sort of being raised by them. But anything at all in the home to do with childcare was was my mum. I, I, I haven't got a clue whether my dad changed any nappies. If I'm, he must have done a few. Um, but you know, I, th I think now, like like Paul says, there's a, there's a, an awful lot of um, my male friends who I would class as being very good hands-on dads. Um, a lot of my colleagues um, in the teaching profession um, who have young children, they take, you know, they, they do their share, but, um, you know, I would stay, stay in our house still. I, I think I, I do more than 50% more than of the share, um, despite the fact that my partner is incredibly hands-on. He's an excellent dad, um, and he, he makes every effort to do everything he can to support me but it does feel like it's him supporting me to do, mm. you know, the primary parenting role uh, to throughout, throughout this crisis. He's an NHS worker. I'm a teacher. Um, I have asthma. So um, I've been sort of medically exempt from actually having to attend school, but I've still been teaching, putting together 25 hours worth of teaching every week, responding to uh, students, to colleagues, um, you know, putting in a 40 hour week, but around the hours that my children are up, so I'm, I'm frequently seeing 3 a.m. You know, not anymore because I'm I'm now I am I've put my laptop away for a week. Um, but where my partner has been out of the door at half past eight and back home at half past five, um, and then having to crack on with labour party business um, after hours, I'm looking after the kids homeschooling, trying to get up to do some exercise, Joe Wicks in front of the telly and, you know, um, keeping keeping them occupied more than anything, stopping them killing each other because they're, you know, arguing like cat and dog because they can't stand the sight of each other because they're fed up with just having each other for company, fed up with having only me for company. Um, and, you know, Pete's done a sterling job going out, doing what he needs to do, um, to earn his crust whilst I'm sat at home trying to earn mine but I'm having to do all of the childcare through the day cooking a meal when he comes in because then he's exhausted now it's it's not normal circumstances right now obviously normally that you know we're both out at work um you know we use the wraparound care at school breakfast club after school and this this is something as well that's going to impact um moving away from talking about the role of dads um, this is something that I think is going to be a huge impact from September, um, where working parents, let's, you know, um, include everybody here, um, working parents find themselves really, really stuck because for our, at our school, for example, I have two young daughters, um, the wraparound care, breakfast club starting eight till nine, they get the breakfast, um, and then after school club from three till normally it's normally six they're bringing it back to half past five during um, sort of from September onwards uh, the wraparound care is only now available for 20 students in the school yeah um, I the, and it was a free-for-all to grab those places they, they launched a system last Monday um, where all the parents had to just sit there with their mouse on the computer to click that they wanted the spaces. I was very, very lucky to get spaces for both of my children. So I have taken one tenth of the places for the breakfast club and the after school club. And I am entirely dependent on that care for my children because I have to, I have to go and do my job. My husband has to go and do his job. Um, but we are just, you know, we're one set of parents in amongst, I don't know, there must be 200 of us in the school who are key workers, absolutely reliant on that care. And that is something that's going to hit us massively in September. The first day that comes along that we can get that wraparound care, what do we do? I think um, you've raised some amazingly important points there. I mean, I'm just desperate to say a whole load of stuff. But, uh, so the one, I, I, one thing I want to say is, is that I always cleaned up the sick. That was my, <laughs> my, my job. And, 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 and sort of, and all the nasties and dirties I, I, I got that was, 
So, the, but what I want to think is two two points that matter that you, you you raised. The first one is that when a man does something, isn't it always portrayed as being oh that's very good, isn't he? He's a good he's a good husband. Him he's doing said well done. My my husband's good on this. And when a woman does it, it's just taken for granted that this is the woman's role. Nobody sort of if you were to praise the the woman for the things she's doing, the way you praise the man for the few things they do, you'd, you'd just be spending half the the day praising the woman. And and so the and uh, two seconds, Kelly, I'll, so, so, and I'll bring you in. Um, the, um, uh, but the second thing I've got to say is, is that I really re relate to what you're saying about the fact about the wraparound care. And, 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 and to a degree, I blame our neoliberal world, which has created this world whereby both the man and the woman of so many households have to work flat out all day, every day. And so to the point whereby they run the school children to school, but they can't even pick them up after school. They have to put them into after school clubs because we have to work, we have to work, we have to get the money to maintain the lifestyle um, because the whole thing is predicated on everybody working flat out all the time. And, and it's sort of, in a way, it's ruined the quality of life, but it has also meant that it's incredibly fragile. And it doesn't, that system that they've got which is basically one of a massive velocity of transactions being um, maintained by um, a whole set of uh, tricks to try because immediately that velocity um, fades away, the whole system collapses, and we've got ourselves into a mess, which is basically um, the mess of capitalism. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in Kelly... And I'm going to be a brief, Kelly, because I both Stuart and Sam will be desperate to say something. Sam, I'm going to leave you till last, my sweet, um, sort of, um, because I think you deserve the last word. But I'm telling you now because I'm terrified of you. Uh, I'm going to take Stuart before you. It's, it's sort of not an issue of his trope, is that? It's just because I'm going to let you have the last word. Kelly first. Um, no, I, I, I knew you were heading that way. And the, the point I was going to make, I had a discussion very recently with a friend of mine. Um, and we were talking about um, when the kids were little, oh, you know, when the kids were little, when the kids were little, this and that. And, and me and my husband were quite lucky in that we worked in the same factory on opposite shifts. And we used to literally swap the kids over in the car park in the factory. He would come in, I would come out. So and they were always with a parent. Um, and we were talking about uh, parents who were vilified for leaving the kids. But what did you have kids for? You just put them in childcare? What did you have them for? What did you have them? Why, why did you bother? And then the opposite, you know, oh, she'll not work. Too busy looking after a kid, she'll not do anything. You know, and it's the, I hate this whole, and it's gone on for, I don't know why it's still going on. It's gone on forever. That we feel like we can't win as parents. I mean, not just as mothers, as parents, we, you can't win. You, you're damned if you do. And you're damned if you don't. And it really winds me up. It, wind, it winded us up 20 years ago when my kids were little. And it winds me up now. Hate it. it was just the other day I had this discussion with a friend who mentioned it quite patterly, shall we say, oh yeah, I mean, when you, your kids were little, you worked full time, yeah, and you just kind of left them. I left them with the dad, but even then, and I felt like I was justifying myself, and I thought, hang on, why am I justifying myself? Like, it, it just, it, it winds me the hell up. That, was that just person was not a friend. You shouldn't have been talking to her. <laughs> Stuart! <laughs> Ooh, uh, I'm actually a stay-at-home dad. And uh, whenever I mention that, the people go, ah, aren't you great? Aren't you wonderful? Aren't you so lucky? And I always have to remind them that it's work. You know, looking after somebody is work. It's not paid work. It's not employment. It's just work. And we need to get to a point where the system and the government and society recognises that this is valuable work that society and the economy needs. We need people to stay at home and look after families so we have a whole generation of taxpayers and workers, you know, ready to take the place of the people who uh, leave us. And uh, we're really struggling to get that drummed in. It's just seen as something that goes on in the background and it's not recognised. And not paid. Absolutely not paid. Yeah. But, I mean, the problem of unpaid carers is, is, is massive. And um, uh, I think um, the, 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 there is a very minor payment that you can uh, claim in extremists. It's got two levels, hasn't it? But not for children, not for looking after your children. Um, Sam, last word. And then Sarah, I'm going to ask you what you have to say about <laughs> the discussion. 
when he can say lovely things about the team of people and how, how marvellous it is to join in with them. And um, so, to, but Sam, you've got the last word on this topic. I mean, if you've been watching closely, you have seen my husband go on that. He went that way with some laundry. He's been up and downstairs because bedtime in my house does usually take till about midnight. I've got two autistic children and a very active four-year-old um, and it is difficult and it's one of one of the things we agreed early doors that um, Alex would be responsible for bedtime um, and yeah yeah we did he's not allowed to be on this call <laughs> a rebellion Alex is this a rebellion <laughs> No, no, you I'm foolish not, man. I'm not shutting him down. He's, he's just uh, not allowed for his job to have anything to do with the politi political broadcast. Um, what? Now he's looking at me. What's the laundry got to do with politics? What's the laundry got to do with politics? Exactly, Alex. Right? Because you can't be a socialist and a sexist at the same time. And you can't say, you can talk about... Uh, wanting to do the right thing and thinking about the, what these women need. But unless you actually get your hands in a washing up bowl, you're not doing enough. I do the washing up as well. Uh, good, good, John, good. Uh, you know, w women, what we need to recognise is there is the physical job. And the lawn. Actually. And I uh, hang out the washing. I do the All right, hang the on, hang go. on. Yeah. You, um, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be a man that's shouting. And the hoovering. John. <laughs> I'm sort you um, <laughs> what we've got is we've got the. Sorry, so, Kelly. I'll make you a medal later for all the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Sam. We're being so stupid. And you're trying to make. <laughs> yeah, <sensible> careful. <laughs> Uh, you know, we've got the physical jobs like the changing the nappy, like the cooking the, the food, all right? But there's a lot of mental work that needs to be done. You need to shop for the food. You need to think about what food you're going to buy. You need to think about, in my case, the fact that we probably have to cook two meals almost every meal time. You, you, you can change the nappy, but who is monitoring the child to know that they need the nappy chains, you know? So it's all of these little incidental things that actually build up all the time to what's called decision fatigue, which a lot of women suffer from because they end up being the primary caregiver who has to make these decisions. Obviously, uh, in a case like Stuart's where he is the stay-at-home father and they've made that decision, he probably knows exactly what I'm talking about because he's got the same decision fatigue where he's got to keep track of what everybody's doing at all times um but another thing to go back to and like i said before my degree was philosophy I, i'm actually a religious studies teacher sarah uh, there you go so i'm all about critically evaluating what is in front of us and um, when the media give us stories that hu humanize boris johnson about him changing nappies and things uh, to try and say look at him he's a he's, he's a modern man he's you know he's not sexist he changes a nappy we need to encourage people to look at all the times the media is not encouraging that comparison uh you know if if boris johnson was a woman he would never have got the leadership of the conservative party if he was a woman he would have been absolutely mort torn to pieces in the media over having a wife that had cancer that he left and then going for a younger woman you know it just wouldn't have happened um even this scruffy hair thing you know <laughs> i've seen hor horrific memes of annalise dodds make good fun of her for her hair um and you know it that's the thing we we rip women apart for how they look but a man is able to intentionally make himself look stupid to make him more affable to the population i just think we really need to highlight where these where these parallels aren't drawn um and unfortunately as you as you know uh, my feminist rage grows ever more <laughs> ferocious and you know it just makes me really despair because we've just got so much work to do before we can say that we've got an equal society. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you. Um, sort of, uh, so Sarah, <laughs> <laughs> up after that, if you dare. No, I don't, I don't, it's not so at all. Um, it's, been, it's been lovely to 
to join in tonight. Um, I, th I think um, this, I, I've, I've worked full time since finishing university, never, never stopped. I took uh, three months maternity for my first baby, four months for my second, only because my pelvis collapsed and I couldn't actually physically walk. But I was, I was toiling away, doing my business. Um, and I often, in, when I was younger, a, young, a young, younger mum, I regretted um, that I didn't take my full 12-month um, allocation of maternity because I felt that um, I'd done a disservice to my children by going out to earn the money that was needed to, you know, keep us fed. Um, I, as a teacher, I'm um, actually the um, primary breadwinner in our house. Um, and it's, it's always been a, um, a bit of a, a thing that I've carried that I chose, I made that choice um, for the good of the family to get straight back to work full time. Um, I've, I've not, I've, I've never um, worked part time um, and I have, you know, every respect for whatever choices parents make, but for us, it was necessary. Um, and I, now I regret regretting the choices I made because I made those choices, um, you know, for the, for the good of the people that I love the most. Um, and I think that's, that's something that is, is not reflected when we talk about working mums, working parents, I think in the media, it's often forgotten that there's this emotional element that goes alongside this. It's, yeah, it's about need. It's about putting bread on the table, but there's also, there's this element of, oh, I'm just getting interrupted here, or maybe not. Um, there's also this element of, um, we, we, we have to do what's right for the, um, sort of for the emotional input into our families as well. Um, I, I know that my children, um, they know that I love them. They know that I, I give them everything that I can. And that part of the reason that I can do that is because I go to work and I have always gone to work. Um, I, I think I'm raising my girls to respect that, um, you know, as the, that mum, you know, does her bit. She, she goes out, she does what she needs to do. And then she comes home, she does what she needs to do. Um, we have an excellent relationship. And I think that's something that is, is really not talked about enough um, in the media. Working mums, and, and I know that... Um, Sam, Kelly, you'll get this, and I, I, I think you'll probably get this as well, Stuart, as, um, as a stay-at-home dad, there's, there's such a stigma around, you know, parents who choose to go to work or parents who choose not to go to work. And it, it, none of that ever takes into account the fact that the choice is partly taken out of our hands by the fact that we have to pay, you know, to put food on the table and we have to pay somebody else to look after our children whilst we go to do that. I think there's, you know, there's such a big discussion to be had. There's so much to put right with this. Um, and every parent, regardless of what choice they make, they carry the stigma around. Um, you can't do, I think somebody said this earlier, you can't do right for doing wrong. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, I could argue this to the end of time. Um, the choices I made, I, I, I regret regretting them now because... They, you know, they were right for me. They were right for my family. They were right for my partner. Um, and they've, they've taught my kids the message that, you know, you have kids, you, you do what you need to do to look after them. And yeah. sometimes, sometimes you, can, you can't do what you need to do to look after them. And that's why we need to be, you know, prepared to look after those people who need that support as well. I feel in my position, um, I'm, I'm trying to educate the kids that I teach to make you know choices that will mean that they they make good choices for themselves in the future when they have families as well i think it's there's this ongoing you know so saying earlier about um this generational idea about dads and the role that they play in the family um i would i would love to see some of my students in 10 20 years time when they've got kids of their own and see that they're making really lovely choices really good choices for their families because i think this is the way that we change things um we, we can't just lift the Tory government out and drop them out of, you know, off the earth and, and put things in place that we need to, um, you know, develop a socialist society. We can't, we can't do that. 
but what we can do is is teach the the young voters um you know what what the what a difference these choices make how how as as parents we've made the decisions that we've made to support our kids and how they as as young adults and then parents themselves can make the right choices that mean that they they don't need to live in a society whereby a male prime minister is lauded on high for changing his baby's nappy you know because that is what any parent should do regardless of gender regardless of their role in the kid's life if a baby's nappy needs changing just get it changed you know let's let's not make it headline news um, I'm going to interrupt you there, Sam, uh, Sarah, and thank, thank you so much because it's it's way past. We, we we're going to we'll close down the live feed. Um, the um, the one thank uh, sort of I'll bring you two seconds, Paul, and you can close everything <laughs> up. Um, sort of um, God bless you, Sarah, for coming on. Thank you very much indeed. What a valuable discussion. And what I've taken out of this is is that the washing and the dirty nappies. They're what matters in politics. And so much of what we discuss in politics uh, does not matter. And sort of, and I think the Labour Party has to be a party that worries about people who have to change nappies um, in a way that the Tory party is very often uh, the party that worries about people who wonder which hedge fund they're going to put their money in. And, and, and sort of, if that's the difference that defines us, that's good by me. Paul, um, sort of, I'm going to hand over to you now and um, yeah. sort of, you can do what you want. It's, um, it's quite interesting. We, we managed to find our first troll. So um, yeah. we've, got, we've got a lovely troll, Kenny. Yeah. We've got, troll. we've got someone who found our discussion so important that he decided to try to post things about like grooming gangs and different things. He's got a beautiful profile picture. Um, I just want to send out my love to that guy um, because he clearly needs it. Um, <laughs> Take up knitting <laughs> is my suggestion. Um, it's, it's just, you know, we don't often get the chance to say this. Does anyone know what the difference between a grooming gang and a paedophile ring is? <laughs> Do you, do you know? I, I, I do, it's just, I don't know how widely known it is. We think about it just by the semantics. It's basically, um, it's intent. Um, so if a grooming gang is considered to be a grooming gang, if they uh, are preying on vulnerability, a paedophile ring is considered to be a paedophile ring if they are, give, if it's a purely sexual thing, that's the difference. They both do the same thing. They both do the same crime. Mm. But one is because they perceive people to be vulnerable. And the other is because people perceive people to be sexually attractive. Now, um, how do you know, do you know what is vastly more prevalent? Grooming gangs. I think I know. What is it? <laughs> So, I mean, the, the, the point we're getting at, isn't it, is that people, uh, people talk about grooming gangs as a, as a dog whistle towards a racist stereotype, but actually we've got plenty of white men who prey on young children, but it tends to be um, called paedophile rings or, yeah. or they call them paedophiles. So we've got different terminology, which is used for different ethnicities of people. Um, so, oh, Sean says it's rubbish. Oh, he's, oh I'm hurt. Bless him. I'm hurt. Bless him. So, um, so, <laughs> yeah, so basically, you're right. It's, it's, it's kind of a, basically, they both do the same absolutely appalling crime. And if you're not against mm. the pedophile rings and you're only against the grooming guns. Yeah. And while we're here, I mean, I would encourage anybody uh, who wants to not see him, please do just uh, block Sean. Um, but I, I just want to make the point that if you use Emily Jones, as a political weapon, you are disrespecting her memory and doing something that her family have specifically asked people not to do. That is despicable, right? It's disgusting. Don't do it. And right. You should call this one now, John, because that was good. <laughs> oh. Are we going to bring this, uh, bring the program to an end, then, Paul? Yeah. Is that it now? I think, I think so. It's your show, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much I'm gonna uh, I'll, uh, I'll just do the thing and we'll 
We'll wait. Uh, yes, let's, let's just do it properly. Um, goodbye, Paul. <laughs> goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, Barbara Claire. Goodbye. Goodbye, Stuart Sutherland. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> really nice to meet you. God bless, Kelly. Thank you so much for coming on. Spot on, another time. Sam, you were monumental tonight. <laughs> God bless. Thank you very much indeed. And Sam, God bless you. And to Simon, who is, uh, if you're still listening, Simon. Uh, thank you for your contribution as well. Goodbye, everybody. Same time next week, apart from Sean. Don't bother, Sean. Don't bother. We keep the red flag flying here.